Okay, so now let's discuss the problem set three. So the first question in problem set three is about uh, the formation of a uh, hydrate. So as we uh, know, you know aldehydes and ketones can actually form diols, and the diols are geminal diols. Okay, and so the structure of these geminal diols are something like this, and so you could have uh, you know r and then h if it's an aldehyde for example and so you can actually measure the equilibrium constant and uh, the way you would do this is uh, you know aldehydes and ketones actually have a very nice absorption pretty much in the uv visible region and so monitoring the absorption of the aldehyde you can actually determine the rate constant. So, the way the experiment is done is that you would take the aldehyde and measure the, you know, this is the absorption and this is lambda. And so, you would measure the absorption of uh, the aldehyde in an organic solvent. Maybe you can put it in uh, acetonitrile or THF or something and measure the absorption. Okay. And now, let's say we start with one molar of the aldehyde. And measure the absorption, you will get some value. Okay. Then you make the same one molar solution in water. Okay. So when you do this in water, what will happen, as what may happen, is that the aldehyde will convert, aldehyde or ketone will convert to the hydrate. Okay. So the hydrate does not have an absorption at this wavelength. Okay. So therefore, you will find that this absorption goes down when in water. All right, and so by measuring this difference in absorption, you can actually estimate how much of aldehyde has formed the diol. All right, and so you can experimentally determine the concentration of the carbonyl compound, which is the what you started with, and you can get the carbonyl compound after you added water. And if you assume that the water concentration is 55 molar or whatever, you can estimate the concentration of water. And the concentration of hydrate will be a difference in these two values. Okay. So, this is actually an experimentally determined value. And so, you get an equilibrium constant of 41 with formaldehyde. And as the substitution on this aldehyde goes up, and if you form a ketone, the value of the equilibrium constant goes down. Okay. So, the question here is what is the percentage conversion of the carbonyl compound to the hydrated form? Okay. So, I have worked out the answer. The way you would do this is you would, uh, you know, take uh, the aldehyde concentration and water concentration and then you, like I told you, this is actually an experimentally measurable value and then you divide this and you get the K hydration. Okay. So, from this K hydration, if you assume that the concentration of water is 55.5 molar, then you can actually find out the percentage of conversion to hydrate. Okay. So, the value for formaldehyde if you work this out, is 99.96. The value for acetaldehyde is 50. This is percent. And for um, tertiary butyl aldehyde, which is shown here, the value is 19. And lastly, for acetone, it is 0.14. Okay. So when moving from formaldehyde to acetone, you have completely reversed the percentage conversion to the hydrate. Okay. So one of the ways in which we want to understand this is that, as you know, it's an equilibrium between the carbonyl and the hydrate. And so the position of the equilibrium depends on what groups are attached to C double bond, so which is obvious in the case of formaldehyde, acetaldehyde and acetone. Okay. So formaldehyde, as we found out, basically it doesn't have any aldehyde in solution in water, whereas acetone hardly has any hydrate present in water. So therefore, like with many other effects, they depend on both sterics and electronics. So the alkyl substituent, as we have, you know, as you might have studied earlier, stabilizes this carbonyl compound and therefore the position of the equilibrium can be altered by adding more alkyl groups on this position. So if you have R versus H, once you replace the H with an R, then the ketone becomes more stable. Okay, so therefore, though the reactant of this molecule of this equilibrium, which is the carbonyl compound, 
actually gets more stable and therefore you know the population of the ketone increases and therefore the equilibrium constant is going to change okay so this is an important example of how you can use you know experimental data to actually make interpretations about the stability of various participants in an equilibrium now let's move on to the next question which is to propose a mechanism of the reaction of uh, cyclohexanone uh, with ethylene glycol and it gives you this uh, cyclic acetal as the product okay and there's another piece of information that's given which is that the carbonyl oxygen if it's labeled then none of the product had this label in the uh, what has been shown okay so now how does this mechanism go forward so in general a mechanism of uh, acetal formation goes in the following way the aldehyde gets protonated and after the aldehyde gets protonated the alcohol which is roh you know can attack in this and then you push this electrons back here and you form this kind of an intermediate okay if this loses a proton then you form a hemiacetal okay so the formation of hemiacetal is pretty straightforward and now the hemiacetal can further undergo protonation so one of the ways in which it can undergo protonation is basically to give you back this kind of a intermediate but you know it can also undergo protonation at the oh and that gives you this protonated water and protonated water can leave and you can generate a carbocation okay so now this carbocation is particularly interesting because it can form a resonance form uh, such as as shown here which is extremely stable because both the carbon and oxygen have octet of electrons okay so therefore this might be one of the reasons why the this kind of an intermediate can actually be produced now if you attack on this intermediate if another alcohol molecule attacks then you are going to produce this kind of an intermediate which can lose a proton to give you the acetal so if we were to draw this last step with cyclohexanone if we draw the last step so you get co ch2 ch2 oh right so this is going to be your intermediate that is formed with cyclohexanone and ethylene glycol the remaining steps are the same so this attacks it's an intramolecular attack and it gives you the eventually it gives you the product which is this okay now how do we account for the labeled result so if you notice when we start with this with c double bond o being labeled if you start with this oxygen which is being labeled then you will find that that particular oxygen it is actually in this step here and it is actually lost as water okay and once the carbocation is formed there is no exchange that happens which will give you the intermediate that you look for which is even if water exchanges it's going to go back and it's still going to continue to be labeled and the water that is being kicked out is going to be labeled okay what it tells you is that there is no exchange of oxygen between this ethylene glycol oxygen and this carbonyl oxygen okay and i would say that yes it is consistent with the proposed mechanism because in nowhere in the mechanism we propose that the ethylene glycol oxygen undergoes a exchange with the water let's move on to the next question so here this is something that we have already discussed in class so i'm going to go through this uh, quickly so here you know i'm giving you a little bit of flavor of nmr i'm going to i have a separate lecture on nmr so you know some of you can uh, refer to that but we don't need uh, too many concepts of nmr here we just need to understand that the number of peaks and so on which is fairly reasonable to propose you know given the information that we have so if i look at this nmr spectrum we have two peaks in the aromatic region and all the other peaks are in the aliphatic region so we are mainly interested in the peaks at the aromatic region and keep in mind that the yield of the compound is 94% okay so if i look at the product that can be formed the product has basically this hydrogen here and this hydrogen here which is basically two sets of hydrogens because these two hydrogens are identical that is i am going to color it in yellow so these two are the same and these two are the same 
uh, if you look at symmetry wise. So therefore, you would see two sets of signals, which is what you see here in this NMR spectrum. So therefore, the major product that is formed is actually the para compound. Now, in order to cross check this, let me draw out the peaks, I mean the hydrogens of the ortho derivative. And you will find that there are going to be four sets of signals that would be produced if this was the major product. And now if you move on to the next slide, you find that you would expect that you will have uh, four sets of uh, signals that are going to be formed. But in fact, when you look at the NMR spectrum, if you stare at it uh, hard enough, uh, you will see only three sets of signals. Okay. And uh, so the reason for this is that, uh, you know, two of the signals are actually merging uh, to produce one signal. And therefore, you see, you know, only three distinct signals in the aromatic region. But nevertheless, what we can infer is even if you did not know this, what you can infer that this NMR spectrum does not correspond to this product. It would either correspond to this product or another derivative. But since the mass of this product is this is the same, it's quite likely that you can suggest that it would be the ortho compound. Okay. Now let's move on to the next question. So here, you know, we have used O18 labeled water, and uh, we've attacked the epoxide with this molecule in the presence of H plus. So in the presence of H plus, we could expect that you know this epoxide ring can be protonated, and you form this uh, protonated epoxide. And now this becomes a very, very good leaving group because it's a neutral uh, hydroxyl group that is leaving. And, you know, the center that is over here can actually get activated or can be a site for attack or it can also attack at the other position. Now, given the result that we have, that is there's 99.5% of this and 0.5% of this, it's highly likely that the attack actually happens the way we have shown it, which is given here. Okay, so it gives you this product with the oxygen label on it, which gives you the major product. Now, based on this proposal, what we can suggest is that, you know, when water attacks this disubstituted carbon, it almost seems like the bond that is between carbon and oxygen has already started breaking even before the attack of water, because that would produce a stronger positive charge over here, and that makes the center more reactive. Okay. So this is something that we can infer that, you know, the carbon oxygen bond after protonation has already started breaking. And therefore, between these two centers, that is between this center and this center, clearly the more substituted uh, carbon is better suited, better able to accommodate the positive charge. And so therefore, this bond breaks in preference to the other one. Now, looking at the labeling data, we can see that the label ends up on this carbon, that is the water label ends up on this carbon or it ends up on this carbon. So therefore, we don't find a situation where the label has actually gone to both carbons. So what it also means is that there is no exchange going on between the water oxygen and the epoxide oxygen. Okay. So this also could mean that this attack here may be an irreversible step. That is, once you form this kind of an intermediate, this doesn't close back and kick out water. Because if that happens, then what can happen is that this oxygen can also attack here and kick out water. And you will see the label ending up on both the carbons. That is, the, both of the carbons will have labeled oxygens. So that doesn't seem to happen. So based on this inference, what we can say is that it seems like there is no exchange of labeled water with oxygen of the epoxide. So maybe once the epoxide ring is opened, it is an irreversible process. The second inference is that the regioselectivity of this process is quite high and the more substituted carbon is the preferred site of attack. What the way we might reason this out is that the epoxide ring maybe partially opens up and there's a partial positive charge on this epoxide ring after protonation. And that positive charge is better accommodated in the more substituted carbon. And therefore, that becomes the site of attack of water. Okay. Now, let's move on to the next question. So here, I have labeled these carbons as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And so this is basically a rearrangement, uh, intramolecular reaction. It's not a rearrangement, sorry. It's an intramolecular reaction uh, where you get you know, this product 
which is 342.10, which is the same mass as the starting material. Okay. Now, you know what the clue that we have been given is that the peak at 1700 centimeters has disappeared over two hours, and so therefore you don't have any ketone in the product. Okay. So the product that is formed is likely the attack of this alcohol on this carbonyl to give you a hemiacetal as shown here. And my handwriting is quite terrible, so I've actually drawn this out using ChemDraw. So this might be a good example of how compounds can actually, you know, give you different derivatives like hemiacetal and so on based on the reaction conditions. So notice that under these conditions, the hemiacetal does not give you back the starting material because then you would see that the peak at 1700 would be restored. Okay. Now let's move on to the next question. So this is a reaction of cyclohexanone with hydroxylamine hydrochloride. So hydroxylamine hydrochloride has a full HCl molecule on it. So that is what I am representing here as H+. So the carbonyl compound can actually get protonated to give you this intermediate. And now this carbonyl quite suitable for attack and hydroxylamine can attack giving you this kind of an intermediate. And now a proton transfer can occur to give you the protonated water over here which can then be kicked out by the formation of an oxy. Okay. So you can keep this mechanism in mind because this is something that we will come back to during rearrangements. All right. Now the next question is about production with sodium borohydride and so you get a mixture of 80 to 20. So this is consistent with what we have observed before. That is when you have two methyl groups of on the uh, norbornane, uh, you end up with uh, the top phase being uh, hindered by the presence of the methyl group. And so the preferred direction of attack is actually from the bottom phase. So keep in mind that if you don't have the methyl group, then the attack from the top phase is preferred. So nevertheless, you get a mixture of 80 to 20 in this case. And this kind of a reaction is actually a stereoselective reaction because a single starting material can form two stereoisomers of the product but it forms one of them preferentially. Okay. Now let's move on to the next question. So here is an example of a hemiketal. So this is a ketal derived from cyclohexanone. And so this hemiketal is in equilibrium with the ketone as well as the alcohol. So if I measure the equilibrium constant, then the value that I get for the methyl compound is 2.16, whereas for the ethanol derivative, I'm getting 237. So this difference is about 100 fold okay approximately so what uh, the inference that we can take from this experiment although there are only two data points is that the larger the alkyl the more the equilibrium is pushed towards the right okay so keep in mind that this is kd so that means that this is the equilibrium constant for dissociation okay now this is something that we can infer from this data all right now in the next question is about pyruvic acid forming you know lactic acid so the question here is that write out the relevant structures so just to give you some perspective here lactate dehydrogenase actually takes pyruvic acid and converts it to lactic acid and it uses this coenzyme which is NADH which is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide which is a source of hydride and at the end of the reaction you actually form NAD plus which is the oxidized form of the coenzyme and uh, here is the structure of his lactic acid for your reference. Okay. Now let's move on to the last question, which deals with the reaction of benzaldehyde and ethylamine. So the general mechanism is shown here. So if you take an aldehyde and react it with a primary amine, then what happens is that if it's done under neutral conditions, then the amine attacks and it gives you this alkoxide. Okay. So you can argue that this alkoxide is extremely unstable and it, it won't be formed, so which is uh, fairly reasonable. So this is why I put an equilibrium arrow here. And so, but if it is formed, it can actually pick up a proton from this NH and then give you this alcohol. And now nitrogen lone pair can come in and kick out hydroxide. Again, hydroxide is a pretty bad leaving group. And so you could argue that hydroxide will not be formed, which is also again reasonable. And so this is again going to be your reversible reaction. So hydroxide ion is going to come and attack and give you back this intermediate. But eventually, because you have a larger concentration of the amine, it's going to form the imine. Okay. 
This is again something that we will take up again in the later part of the course and we will visit amine and enamine chemistry later.